and, and I really do need to acknowledge for those of us who are at NASPGIN, Jeff Himes put together a fabulous presentation on use of anti-TNF, and this was adapted slash stolen, um, you know, <laughs> predominantly from Jeff. I don't know if he's here. Yeah. <laughs> So our, our goals in treating children with IBD are to induce remission, but also to try to achieve excellent quality of life, and more recently, intestinal healing, normal growth of development, and hopefully prevention of surgeries. And ideally, we'd like to do this while minimizing side effects of therapy, and, and also in, increasingly need to think about whether this is what we would view as an acceptable financial cost. So as Jeff nicely summarized at, at NASA again, except for option eight, we probably have many reasonable evidence-based approaches to our patients when they're initially diagnosed with, with IBD. And infliximab after the pediatric trial was approved in 2006, but notably the approval was for pediatric patients with moderately to severely active Crohn's who've had an inadequate response to conventional therapy. And so this would imply that in, that in all patients we would kind of take this what we call accelerated step up approach where we would induce and maintain remission with, with corticosteroids, internal nutrition, thiopurines, or methotrexate, and then really just step up to anti-TNF therapy if those initial approaches aren't working well enough. But the question is, is this still what we're doing in 2013? Are there patients who would benefit from primary th early therapy with anti-TNF? Can we identify who those patients are? And what are the relative benefits or risks of that approach? So I'm just going to do the two in red. Let leave the rest of the speakers to cover those harder questions that follow this. So we know from the REACH clinical trial that about 88% of kids who receive infliximab for induction of remission will respond. About 59% will go into remission. And, and most of those will maintain that remission with kind of optimal dosing uh, a year later. Now, interestingly enough, of course, when, when REACH was put together, it was required that patients be on immunomodulators. And that's a, an aspect of our practice that for many of us has changed uh, since this came out. The IMAGINE trial, which looked at adalimumab in pediatric Crohn's, showed that at least for, for patients who were naive to infliximab and received so-called high-dose therapy, which is the therapy that we actually use in practice now, that you could expect that about 45% would attain remission a year after starting the drug, so certainly also a very effective therapy. So, you know, we haven't done the pediatric version of Sonic, but the question was, could we do something similar to this to kind of try to compare the effectiveness of an early anti-TNF approach versus kind of our, our more standard accelerated step-up approach? So the risk cohort study is a cohort study of 1,100 children with Crohn's that finished enrollment in 2012, and Jeff Himes, Tom Walters, and Mio Kim from our group recently led an exercise called comparative effectiveness analysis to compare outcomes between children who received anti-TNF within three months of diagnosis, children who received early immune modulators within three months of diagnosis, or children who received neither approach. And Tom and Mio took a statistical approach called propensity score matching to match the kids who received early immune modulator or no early immune therapy to those who had received early anti-TNF. So this is comparative effectiveness and kind of the next best thing if you're not going to do an actual randomized clinical trial. Now, as would be expected, there were some kids um, within the anti-TNF group who ultimately received methotrexate, and many kids within the immune modulator or no immunotherapy groups who ultimately stepped up to anti-TNF agents or immune modulators or both. And this was over the course of the, of the full uh, year following diagnosis. So these were all kids who were enrolled at diagnosis and looking at those early treatment choices within the first three months of diagnosis. 
And this has now um, uh, been published in gastroenterology over the past couple of months, so it's, it's available online. So the, the endpoint that we looked at was corticosteroid-free, surgery-free remission one year after diagnosis. And the bottom line was for the, for the group of 68 children from risk who received anti-TNF within three months of diagnosis, 85% achieved uh, this remission, compared to 60% who started with an immune modulator and 54% who started with neither. And so the outcome was superior for the early anti-TNF compared to the other approaches. Now, consistent with data from REACH and other reports, um, the subgroup of kids who received anti-TNF within three months of diagnosis also exhibited catch-up growth shown there in red as an improvement in their height Z score over that year. And there was really no overall change in the height Z score for the other groups. So what does this mean? And this, this really comes right from Jeff's talk. Um, you know, certainly in a comparative effectiveness analysis, early anti-TNF was superior to other options, but it also certainly doesn't mean that every patient with Crohn's should start anti-TNF within three months of diagnosis. So we really need to consider other factors in trying to identify patients who might derive the best benefit from this approach. Now, we also know that there have been a number of studies um, looking at the potential risk of the, of the therapies that we use, and with an individual patient and their parents, this probably far outweighs the efficacy information we have, these worries about these risks. And Marla Dubinsky and Corey Siegel put together a very nice um, summary of data from clinical trials and, and other sources published in IBD Journal this year. They looked at almost um, 2,000 children who were treated with either infliximab or adalimumab, uh, they found that the most uh, common adverse events were either infections or infusion or local site reactions. And in fact, in 132 out of these almost 2,000 patients, this led to discontinuation of the drug. But fortunately, only 54 of these were characterized as serious infections, and then there was one case of lymphoma. So this has been pretty, pretty steady information about anticipated rates of, of adverse events with these agents um, since they became available. Now, the, the thing that we really all are, are dealing with and trying to deal with with individual patients is this black box warning about the hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. And to date, at least, um, each of these cases has really been associated with prior or concurrent thiopurine exposure or, in some cases, uh, exposure to thiopurines alone. Now, the reality is we probably don't have enough long-term data on patients with anti-TNF or anti-TNF with methotrexate to really assess that, but at least there certainly has been a signal that's been coming from the thiopurine agent as well as the anti-TNF. Now, I'm sorry, this, uh, I hate it when people show a slide and they say you can't read this, and this is a very busy slide, but I really just wanted to highlight Marla Dubinsky's paper again, because she put together a really nice option grid for shared decision making, and really broke out the immune modulator option, the anti-TNF option, or the combination therapy option. And the highlights were that you certainly could expect a, a higher chance of achieving re remission steroid-free remission with anti-TNF compared to immune modulator. Here they gave rates of 55% compared to 40%. This is combined adult and pediatric information. But really for these rare adverse events, infections and so forth, the anticipated rates were, were about the same and were not higher than, than 5%. And they also noted for the, the rare risk of lymphoma that this had really been associated with the thiopurine exposure. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at this. This gives a really nice summary of what we know about potential risks of, of biologic or anti-TNF therapy. Now the other thing that we're facing more and more though is the cost of the therapies that we're using. We have families who have um, health spending accounts. Uh, we have one now because I wasn't paying attention. Uh, 
during the yearly re-enrollment um, where I work. Um, and, and so families are increasingly paying more and more of the cost of their medical care out of pocket. Now, you know, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I, when I was getting ready for this talk, I found several um, essentially cost effectiveness of anti-TNF therapies, that had, studies that have been done. Um, interestingly, many of these have been done in the UK and Canada, but uh, some have been done in the US, and I just wanted to share information from one from the UK. Now, it's important to note that they considered uh, adult patients, um, so kind of their characteristic patient was somebody that was 35 to 40 years of age with a confirmed diagnosis of Crohn's for at least three months, and they considered the, the cost effectiveness of kind of standard induction and maintenance therapy with either infliximab or adalimumab, and compared that to cost of care with conventional therapy with five ASAs, immune modulators, and, and of course, surgery. So I, I think as, as we all appreciate in this model, and, and I think in reality about 40% of the lifetime costs of care were modeled to come from surgical care. So a lot of the analyses of the, the benefit of anti-TNF in terms of cost effectiveness has been based on assumptions about how this might reduce rates of surgery. And, and the bottom line in this study is they looked at, at about a 50% rate of reduction in surgeries in patients exposed to anti-TNF therapy, although they did uh, also consider a range from either a 90% reduction to only a 10% reduction. Um, and then they um, calculated uh, the imp incremental cost effectiveness ratio for every quality adjusted life year gained. And the bottom line for this slide is, at least in their model, they assume that an approach where this incremental cost was 30,000 pounds per year or less was a, a cost-effective approach. And so they confirmed that in this model, both infliximab and adalibumab were cost-effective. But importantly, they identified that there might be a window for this cost-effectiveness. Now, it really wasn't clear. It was a very wide window that they postulated in their model. But it did suggest that kind of indefinite treatment with these agents in all patients, you know, ultimately would probably not be a cost-effective approach. Um, so we'll hear a little bit more about whether there are patients where we can stop these agents and what the pros and cons may be. But one thing we may hear about more and more in the future is, is the relative cost-effectiveness of long-term treatment with these agents. So again, stolen from Jeff. Now, Jeff, I'm about to diverge and go to some other slides so you can. Um, but it all comes down to this. Is the reward versus the risk of early anti-TNF therapy worthwhile for your individual patient and their family and, and where they're coming from? So what else can we take into account? Well, probably one of the key things is that individual patient's risk of having more aggressive disease. So we know that some patients will progress rapidly and require multiple surgeries and some will have a fairly benign course. And that most likely with conventional therapy, this may kind of delay the first surgery, but probably doesn't prevent it. We know in a very nice um, study that was done by Neera Gupta published several years ago, that exposure to infliximab was overall associated with significantly lower hazard ratio uh, for surgery associated with IBD. So how can we identify these patients that are at higher risk for surgery? And at this point, the one thing that we've seen in several published studies are these antimicrobial serologies. So in a study published by Marla a few years ago, um, and in many, many studies in, in children and adults have shown the same thing, essentially patients at baseline who had multiple antimicrobial serologies of high titer were more likely to progress and, and develop a complication of disease that might require surgery than patients who were seronegative or who had very low titers of these serologies. And, it, and in a nice paper that subsequently was put together using a systems dynamic model, so this maybe is what we're trying to think about when we're talking to a family about all these things in terms of risks and benefits and prognosis of different um, therapeutic options. 
I think what, what was shown very clearly was that in this subgroup of patients with very high levels of antimicrobial serologies, the, the absolute benefit or reduction in risk for developing a complication was certainly the highest in, with exposure to anti-TNF therapy in this high-risk group. And this is ideally, ultimately, what we would like to be able to do, give families information about their, their clinical course over the next few years and how much introduction of anti-TNF might reduce their risk. On the other hand, interestingly enough, exposure to corticosteroids was associated with higher rates of complications in this group, although that trend did not reach significance. And Corey Siegel put this into a very nice model in which you could toggle in a patient's age, gender, duration of disease, antimicrobial serologies, and estimate their risk for a complication and the absolute benefit of early anti-TNF therapy. Of course, in other patients, you could toggle in features with a very low risk of complications and less absolute benefit in terms of that outcome. So this um, led to the design of the risk study that probably many folks in this room are participating in. This is a study that enro enrolled 1,100 children with Crohn's at diagnosis between 2008 and 2012. Um, kids will actually ultimately be followed for five years minimum from diagnosis to define the children who experience complications. And then we'll, we'll test that sort of model that involves antimicrobial serology and timing of treatment exposures to see whether it really does impact the progression to this complication. So where are we at this point? So we know that anti-TNF therapy is very successful in inducing maintaining remission in most pediatric patients with Crohn's. Uh, there may certainly be indications to offer it early in the clinical course to some patients. Um, you know, I did not include the, the phone calls with the medical director of Anthem that invariably follow and strategies for that, but of course that's a factor that we deal with. Um, but I think, you know, I think there actually is good evidence, and we can discuss this in the panel discussion, that kids with significant growth failure and kids at higher risk of disease complications based on your initial evaluation with deep ulcers, extensive small bowel disease, uh, if you choose to measure at high levels of these antimicrobial serologies, you know, probably are a subgroup that we can identify that will derive the greatest benefit from early anti-TNF versus kind of accelerated step up. And then leading into Dr. Markowitz's talk, uh, the implication also, though, is that we may be able to consider anti-TNF withdrawal in some of these patients once our treatment goals have been met, so have some sort of biologic exit strategy. Thank you.